if you've read Spurgeon, you understand that the man himself was very articulate. His command and presence of the English language was commanding. He had such a well-rounded and formal education of grammar to such a degree that often I wonder if people today really understand what it is he's saying. Because a lot of his beauty of imagery and the way that he's able to correlate and correlate the language itself to such a degree that he flows the lingo of that day in archaic ways that today we often look at it and wonder, wow, do people actually talk like that? More than four letters? It's not an F word and it's not an N word, but it's a G word? That's what Spurgeon is like. And that's why I appreciate Spurgeon so much because he seemed to, in his day, not only be a man, but be a man among men. He was able to bring forth the expression of his soul and direct it in such a way to make men wholly devoted unto God. And that's why devotions of Spurgeon, morning and evening, are so well worth the read in order to understand and comprehend what David must have been like when he was called a man after God's own heart and he wrote the Psalms. Because a lot of ways, that's what Spurgeon is like. Spurgeon seems to have that ability to command the language and to bring it to a place of comprehension so that we would be lost for education to not rise up to the level of the playing field of where he's at so that we might be able to appreciate what it is that he's saying to us each and every day as we look to and we understand he is a man among men and he did have a way of saying things that no one else in his generation seemed to have that capability, coordination and culpability of being able to grasp really the deep things of God and present them to his pasturage in a way that would cause men to go, wow, that was amazing. For as the sufferings of Jesus abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. 2 Corinthians 1.5 Here is a blessed proportion. The ruler of providence bears a pair of scales. In this side he puts his people's trials, and in that he puts their consolations. He balances the scales. When the scale of trial is nearly empty, you will always find the scale of consolation in nearly the same condition. And when the scale of trials is full, you will find the scale of consolation just as heavy. When the black clouds gather most, the light is more brightly revealed to us. When the night lowers and the tempest is coming on, the heavenly captain is always closest to his crew. It is a blessed thing that when we are most cast down, then it is that we are most lifted up by the consolations of the Spirit of God. One reason is because trials make more room for consolation. The greater the hurt, the more love fills in. Great hearts can only be made by great troubles. The spade or the hoe, the shovel, of trouble digs the reservoir of comfort deep and deeper and makes more room for even more consolation. God comes into our heart and he finds it full. He begins to break up our comfort zone and our comforting, clinging vines that have overrun our garden and caused it to be full of garbage that we no longer need. He, bring in, he brings in, he begins to break our comforts and make it all empty. Then there is more room for grace. The more that he takes out, he replaces with grace. The humbler a man lies, the more comfort he will always have, because he will be more fitted to receive it. To whom much is forgiven, he loveth much. 
another reason why we are often most happy in our troubles is this then we have the closest dealings with god we are never so close as when we cry out in desperation as when we say god help me then we say god bless me you see it's always the consolation of god that comforts us it is not the adoration of our worship that brings us closer to god but rather the breaking of our hearts that brings us to the intimacy of the sufferings of jesus and we become one with god when the barn is full man can live without god and when the purse is bursting with gold we try to do without so much as prayer when we are satisfied and satiated in our worship in mega churches of course we feel as though we are closest and yet probably farthest from god almighty but once you take away our comforts once you take away our special place in god's grace once you remove our leaning stick so to speak then we want our god back once we cleanse the idols out of the house then we are compelled to honor god out of the depths have i cried unto thee o lord and it wasn't from the heights of the mountaintop for we find ourselves silent in those places there is no cry so good as that which comes from the bottom of the mountains no prayer half so hearty as that which comes from the depths of the soul through deep trials and afflictions we go and it brings us closer to god and makes us whole hence they bring us to god and we are happier for the nearness of god and nearer to god is happiness indeed come troubled believer fret not over your heavy troubles for they are the heralds of weighty mercies for should it have been in the day that you decided to disregard that with which god takes in high regard you'll find that in those days and in those times it is those trials that bring you closest to god in a way you never dreamed of before for it is in that time that god comes near for we are told that it is in his mercies and his grace that we find our place and we are forgiven for it is of the lord's mercies that we are not consumed and his loving kindness that we find renewed every morning so when we are in trials and tribulations rejoice look up your salvation draweth nigh for even in that time you are closer to god than you ever would have dreamed possible